We are the sum total of our educations, of the experiences we have, and the lessons we learn. At Merrillville College, you study everything, so you'll be prepared for anything, because life is filled with the unexpected. Wherever your path takes you, we'll make sure you're ready to lead.
We are the sum total of our educations, of the experiences we have, and the lessons we learn. At Merrillville College, you study everything, so you'll be prepared for anything, because life is filled with the unexpected. Wherever your path takes you, we'll make sure you're ready to lead.
We are the sum total of our educations, of the experiences we have, and the lessons we learn. At Merrillville College, you study everything, so you'll be prepared for anything, because life is filled with the unexpected. Wherever your path takes you, we'll make sure you're ready to lead. We are the sum total of our educations, of the experiences we have, and the lessons we learn. At Merrillville College, you study everything, so you'll be prepared for anything, because life is filled with the unexpected. Wherever your path takes you, we'll make sure you're ready to lead.
We are the sum total of our educations, of the experiences we have, and the lessons we learn. At Merrillville College, you study everything, so you'll be prepared for anything because life is filled with the unexpected. Wherever your path takes you, we'll make sure you're ready to lead. Well, hello and welcome to the eighth set of presentations from Scott Science Scholar Summer Experience. This is our eighth year and definitely our most interesting year, we think. <laughs> um, my name is Angela Gibson. I'm a professor of chemistry and I'm one of the co-directors of this program. I work really closely with my close friend and colleague, Dr. Maria Siapsis, who is the other co-director of the program and she is a professor of mathematics. So we are very happy to um, introduce the program today. What we're going to do, I'm going to just share a few acknowledgments with you. I want to talk to you about all the people who work together to make this program happen um, and then tell you just a little bit about our students and what they've been doing this, this past couple of weeks. And then they are going to share with you the work that they have accomplished over the last couple of weeks. So we're really excited about that. Um, this program would not happen at all without tremendous support from a lot of people. Uh, first of all, the administration of the college, Dr. Brian Coker, the president, uh, Dr. Dan Klingensmith and Dr. Melanie Tucker, both vice presidents, deans of academic affairs and dean of students, 
Uh, they helped us tremendously in providing guidance, especially this year uh, when we were doing things on a very different kind of schedule with different kinds of policies and rules, and they helped provide a lot of information about that. We'd also like to thank our good friends over in Mountain Challenge. They have always been an integral part of the program. They put together welcoming activities for us. Uh, they put together welcoming activities for us, and they did that this year in some creative ways that helped get us off to a good start with understanding the rules of masking, masking and physical distancing and how we can orchestrate that while we actually accomplish some uh, rigorous and robust academic and even some social activities. So we're very ha happy and thankful to the work of Mountain Challenge. Uh, we have a lot of folks to support, just many, many offices on campus that help support this program. Uh, Mr. Eric Etchison, I have to give a shout out to him. He's in the back room right now and he has worked really closely with us. He's from athletics, uh, has taken a break from athletics today to come over and help us live stream this event. So thank you, Eric. Uh, we also want to send a special shout out to Mary Workman and Jacob Haskew over in communications who do a lot with photography and helping us to um, helping us to get um, publicity out about the program. Um, this program uh, this year has, has run with the help of a lot of additional uh, instructors. And so I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, a few students. So these are junior and senior students who came in and actually led programs for us. So Jordan Dopp, who's a senior biochemistry major, Hannah Simmons and Megan Poe junior computer science majors, and they'll, the students are going to tell you a little bit more about the work that they did um, in leading programs. We also had faculty guests who led several programs for us, Dr. Jennifer Brigatti, Dr. Jo Joy Bongiorno, Dr. Danielle Lincoln, Dr. Drew Crane, and Dr. Dave Unger from the Division of Natural Sciences, and Dr. Jeff Bay and Dr. Anna Engelson from the Division of Mathematics and Computer Sciences. They all came in and led activities with our students, and again, the students are going to tell you a little bit more in a lot of detail, actually, about what they did with, um, with many of these faculty. Um, we would not be able to run this program without money, <laughs> and so it's important for us to thank the National Science Foundation providing, for providing funding through grants uh, to establish this program originally eight years ago, and now to keep it going on a second iteration uh, so thanks to the National Science Foundation, we've also had grants from Arconic and General Electric to fund different components of the program, and we have many, many generous donors who help support program and provide scholarships and activities that we wouldn't be able to do just with the, with the regular funding. So we are grateful for all of that. Um, this program <laughs> really, really would not run without the folks that you see right here on this screen. Lindsay Walton is our STEM success manager and she comes in every evening and keeps these guys doing homework after they have had a long hot day outside or a long tedious day in the lab. She keeps them busy with homework and provides counseling and guidance and uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of pep talks for these guys. So Lindsay Walton, and she does that through the summer, but then she's doing that all year academically to help support these guys. Um, the peer mentors this year, amazing team of peer mentors. Kaylin Finnegan, who is a senior biochemistry and neuroscience major. Nathan Kyo, Kyo who is a sophomore computer science major. Jonathan Meistrick, a sophomore computer science and mathematics major. And then Julia Warwick, a senior biochemistry major. These guys work so hard. So they are with the students all day, every day, helping get them to, from place to place, making sure they show up dressed and with all the supplies that they're gonna need for their individual activities. Um, and their work does not end at five o'clock when Dr. Siopsis and I have checked out or gone on to other activities. The peer mentors are staying there through the STEM success at night and working with these guys, helping make sure everybody's up and rallied in the mornings. They really have worked tremendously hard. And this year, COVID year, we've had some special challenges that the peer mentors have had to help us be mindful of. So constantly reminding about the social distancing and masking and making sure that we are in compliance with different policies to keep everyone safe. And the peer mentors have been tremendous help for that this year. We have some little thank yous for you guys that we're gonna hand out uh, at, the, at the end. And we're just really grateful for this amazing team that has really, really provided a lot of benefit uh, for, the, for the program. And I know in addition to the, like, the logistics, these guys are also there 
just being good friends and being good mentors and role models to, to, the, to the younger students. So we are so very grateful to them. Um, and this week, this year, finally, like to huge shout out to the team of amazing, amazing Scott Science Scholars. I don't know if they're all pictured here, uh, but this group has really been tremendous. They have showed up. <laughs> they have kept their masks on. They have worked tremendously hard on probably the hardest set of projects mathematically and scientifically we have ever done in this program. They came and did it with great attitudes, with their cell phones hidden and dressed appropriately, masked on. They helped us to enforce and stay in compliance with labs so that we can actually do labs while maintaining those guidelines of six feet apart for no more, or six feet apart unless it's under 10 minutes. So we were really, really careful about that. And they have been really careful and helped us with enforcing these policies, abiding by these policies, but also just learning. And they've had really great attitudes. They're a great group and we're excited to welcome them to Maribel College. And I'm excited for them to share with you what they have been doing for this last week and a half uh, and so I'm going to turn the floor over to the first group who is going to share with you uh, about their project. presenting on evaluating the efficacy of masks, hand washing, and hand sanitizers. My name is Josie McCullers. I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee, and my intended major is biology. In my free time, I love to horseback ride, I love to play with my dog Finn, and I play soccer. My name is Ben Bergen. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. My major is biochemistry with a focus in pre-med, and my hobbies include spending time with my family, being outdoors, and spending time with my dog. I also play Ultimate Frisbee, and in my free time, you can probably find me either on the lake or somehow incorporating the outdoors into my life. My name is Rory Walker, and I'm from Morristown, Tennessee. My intended major is biochemistry. In my free time, I like to play soccer or the piano or spend time with my dog, Ralphie, who is the absolute love of my life. Before we start our presentation, we just want to give a special thanks to Dr. Bugatti, our lab leader, as well as our peer mentors, Julia Ward and Kaylin Finnegan for guiding through our lab and helping us with any questions that we came across. Our lab tested two procedures, hand washing and hand sanitizing efficacy and mask efficacy. And we measured our data through quantitative measurement and counted the production of bacteria colonies. We replicated our procedures multiple times in order to eliminate bias and to get the most accurate data possible. Before we go into the details of the lab, there are a couple of terms that we need to understand so we can fully explain all of what we did. The first of these terms is CSU, or colony forming units. This is just what we use to measure the amount of bacteria that we actually see grow on the auger plate. After this, we have mechanical and chemical. These are simply the means that we have of neutralizing or removing the bacteria from your hands. Mechanical is going to use force, while chemical is going to use chemical reactions. After this, we have soap versus detergent. Soap is just going to be a mixture of oil, salt, and water. All detergent is going to have these as well as chemical agents in it. A surfactant is just going to be something that breaks up the oils and dirt that's on the surface of your skin or on the surface of whatever it's being applied to. After this, for the mask or no mask part of our lab, we have the respiratory droplets. These are the droplets that carry your saliva that have bacteria from your throat, and these go six to eight feet, and they're going to drop initially due to gravity. The other part of this is going to be the aerosol. This is the vapor that's going to rise and has a lower amount of the viral load, or just amount of virus, but it can be spread throughout the environment at a greater rate. The last term is viral load, and this is just the amount of concentration of the virus or bacteria. So, before we go into hand sanitizing, we need to understand how it actually works. Hand sanitizer is a chemical agent that is actually working to kill bacteria. The way it does this is by using its ethanol from the ethyl alcohol. The ethanol is going to work to denature the outside of the bacteria cell wall. When it does this, it is going to kill and neutralize that bacteria. We also have the OH group in this as well, which is the alcohol. This is going to bond to the water that's in the hand sanitizer, which allows the ethanol to carry all the way over your hands, rather than just one localized spot. 
So to begin, we're going to discuss our procedure for the sanitizing portion of the lab. We started by labeling our auger plates on the auger side so that if we lost the lid, we would still know what was in it, with four being labeled controls and two for each variable. We then dipped a sterile swab into distilled water and swabbed it from our right index finger to the bottom of our palm three times. We rolled the swab onto the auger plate to transfer the bacteria. And we repeated steps two and three with our right ring finger and those were labeled control one and two. We then sanitized our right hand and repeating those steps, this time using our middle and pinky fingers, labeled those sanitized one and sanitized two. So here we have some of our sanitizing plates, the top being after sanitizer and the bottom being our two controls. Our data table shows the percent reduction of um, our hand sanitizing portion of our lab. At the bottom you can see our average uh, percent reduction was 89.78 and our total number of colonies on average was 401.28 colonies forming units. On our graph you can see that after all of our plates were observed, our percent of bacterial reduction was above 65%. Our mean percent reduction was 89.78%, and our median being the most accurate since it eliminates the uh, outliers in our data, being 96.74%, and our standard deviation was 12.26. So in the next part of our lab, we're looking at hand washing. Again, we need to understand the actual process of what is happening here so we can fully understand all of what is happening. The first part that we need to recognize is that soap is just a mixture of oil, salt, and water. It also might have less than 1% of the fragrances and those types of solutions, but the actual things that we need to worry about is the oil, salt, and water. The reason these are important is because the oils on your skin are going to bond with the oil that's in the soap. When that happens, any of the bacteria that's on that surface level of your hands is going to be stripped away. Now, we also need this oil then to be carried away. This is where the salt comes into play. The salt is, have, is going to have a polar bond on it, which is going to bond to the water, which is allowing the oil to be carried away. Because non-polar bonds to non-polar, that's also why the oil from the soap bonds to the oil on your hands. So now we'll talk about the procedure for the hand washing portion of the lab. The steps that I mentioned earlier where we swabbed our fingers, we now did on our left hand, labeling those control three and four. We then washed our hands according to the CDC guidelines of approximately 20 seconds. We did the other steps again, swabbing our middle and pinky fingers, labeling those washed one and two. Afterwards, we placed all of our auger plates, auger side up in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for about 48 hours. When the time was up, we counted the colony forming units on the plates. And here we have some of our hand washing plates with the top being our control and the bottom being after we washed our hands. As a group, we gathered our data again and we calculated our average percent reduction to be about 69.34%. And then we counted our colonies and obtained a total average number of colonies of 590.5 colonies. Units. Our graph again shows that our percent of bacterial reduction was above 30% for all of our plates observed. Our mean percent reduction was 69.34%, our median percent reduction was 70.49%, and our standard deviation was 22.75. So then we did a, an experiment to test the efficacy of our masks. The majority of us wore the MC mask while some were their own. So we labeled our auger plates again on the auger side, three mask on and three mask off. We took all six of the plates outside with three gloves and our mask. With our gloves and mask on, we held a plate open around two inches from our mouth and coughed on it three times. We covered the plate and then repeated it with the other two labeled mask on. We then took off the mask and repeated the process for the three plates labeled mask off. We removed the glove that we coughed on and replaced it with a clean glove so that we would not contaminate anything else or touch stuff that we had coughed on. So we placed the plates auger side up and incubated those at 37 degrees Celsius as well for 48 hours. We then counted the bacterial colonies. And here we have a couple of the results from our mask on and mask off experiment. 
This is our data for the masks, with the top being the MC masks and the bottom being any of the non-MC masks. You can see that each number is going to represent one of the plates. Um, and additionally, on the right side, you can see the number of colonies. This is why we need to know what SFU stands for. Because whenever we look at this, you can see that there are some numbers that only have nine, seven, or five total colonies. What that means is that for both the control, which is without the mask, as well as with the mask, you can see that if there are only nine total, that means that the percent reduction might be a wild number in up to like the 400 percent because the amount of colonies that you're looking at is going to be so low, you can't really get a good data from that. So due to that, our results for the mass part of our lab were inconclusive. A few sources of inconsistency in our lab were recontamination after washing our hands, such as when we turned off the faucet without using a paper towel, or drying our hands with a paper towel that someone else had already touched. Additionally, some may have used a different method of washing their hands that is not the CDC guideline of 20 seconds. Third, our coughing was not controlled, as there may have been different amounts of respiratory droplets in each cough per person. Lastly, our hygiene was varied at different rates because some of us may have brushed our teeth or used hand sanitizer before the lab, thus misrepresenting the amount of bacteria that typically would have been in the respiratory droplets or on our hands. So, the applications of this lab are incredibly relevant to everything happening in the world right now. As you all know, COVID-19 is a major issue. So, understanding what we can do to practice good hygiene, both why we should do it, but also how to practice good hygiene, is more important than ever. Along with this, it's also really important to understand why drawing is important. Most people know that you should wash your hands and you should use hand sanitizer. But not everybody understands how you should be drying your hands properly. The proper use is to use the paper towel to turn off the faucet. Then you should throw it away. If you use it and then you go ahead and throw it away and touch the faucet again, you're going to recontaminate your hands and you're getting probably more bacteria than you had before because every person that touches that faucet has their bacteria on that as well. Due to this, this allows us to recognize and it helps others understand why you need to be careful about how you're washing your hands and how you be conscious about what you're doing and how you're acting, both while washing hands, but also just out in the world. This also applies to our College Medical College because every single campus is going to have to change how we are acting in order to apply our lives and apply the knowledge that we are gaining to protecting ourselves and keeping ourselves safe as well as keeping others safe. These are our sources that we use for our project. Up next, we have Daryl and Valentino presenting on Orchard. Any questions from the audience? All right, well, thank you guys for your time. My name is Valentino Morales, and this is my partner, Daryl Rice, and today we'll be presenting our Orchard Observation Lab. Before we begin, we would like to thank Dr. Crane for his help and contribution to this study. He was an essential part of our data and research, and he provided us with the data that is in this presentation today. My name is Daryl Rice. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm planning on majoring in engineering this semester. Uh, my hobbies are hanging out with my family and playing basketball. As you see there, I'm with my brother and my grandfather. And this, uh, this year, I plan on playing basketball here at Maryville College. My name is Valentino Morales. I plan to major in computer science. I come from Sevier County High School, which is pretty close to here. It's only about 40 minutes away from Maryville College. And this is actually a picture of me doing the Orchard Lab. The purpose of this is to provide fresh fruit to Pearson's cafeteria and help domestic fruit production here and localize everything and it gives us the opportunity to eat out of our own backyard. And the purpose of this lab is to examine the health of these trees. The background information. So there, here on campus there are three orchards, the one by the Crawford House and two in the Maryville College Woods. The two in the woods are called the Knoll and the Brown Creek Orchard. 
and these are the only two we observed for this study. The orchards here were built in 2012, and like I said, the goal of the lab is for, the, for us to show the health of these two orchards. So before we move on to anything uh, more detailed, we're going to talk a little bit about the terminology. And right here, we're going to discuss the two diseases that we found present on the trees. First, we have cedar apple rust. It is characteristically defined by these yellow lesions that it forms on the leaves that it infects. It's a uh, fungus that typically propagates in warm and wet weather, so you'll see it oftentimes it spreads during the spring. Pyre blight is also one that's easily distinguished because of its effect on the leaves. It, uh, it wilts them and it darkens their color, which makes it look like it has been burnt by some sort of flame. So on the next slide, you will see a key, and those uh, on their key are abbreviated terms, and these are the abbreviated terms. So P stands for Potomac Pears, G and GR stands for Gold Rush, GD stands for Golden Delicious, and HC stands for the Hardy Cumberland. As you can see on the top is the Hardy Cumberland, below that is the Golden Rush, and below the Golden Rush is the Golden Delicious, and on the far left is the Potomac. As Daryl said before, here we have the key. Essentially, it just illustrates the position of where the trees are in the orchard. And as for the procedure, the way that we went about this lab is that we separated into seven groups, each one having two people. And we went to each orchard and we measured the trees. So there were 10 trees in Knoll that we measured and five trees in Browns Creek that we measured. And what we measured were, first, the number of fruits. This is uh, <clears throat> this is a pretty clear indicator of health. If a, fruit, if a tree has enough nutrients to grow fruit, then it has enough nutrients to be healthy and it has enough nutrients to grow. Then we also assess the disease present. This is also an obvious indicator of health. Diseases aren't good for a tree, so whenever they're present, we know that in some way, shape, way, or form, it's being damaged. And especially in this case with uh, the cedar apple rust and the fire blight, they can actually decrease the number of fruit that's being produced by a tree by infecting the flower, which uh, then stops the fruit from being formed. And then we also calculated the circumference at 30 centimeters off the ground of the tree. And the reason this is a good indicator of health is because if a tree has enough nutrients to uh, grow, the thicker it is, the more nutrients it had, which means that it can grow more. And it works the same way in the opposite. If it didn't have a lot of nutrients, then the tree's likely going to be much thinner. This is the lab notebook. This is just an example of what we did while we were out there. On the left, the two on the left are from the Knoll Orchard, and the one on the right is from the Browns Creek Orchard. As you can see, we uh, gathered the data from the seven groups, and we calculated that diameter and averaged them out for each tree. So on the top is the knoll, and on the bottom is the Browns Creek. And on the bigger chart, we took the number of fruits and averaged it out out of all seven groups. And on top is the knoll, and below that is the Browns Creek. So before we had simply charts, but this is a better visual representation of the data. We have um, these bar graphs here that uh, define and demonstrate the average diameter that we measured of each tree. On the left, we have the null orchard trees. And like I said before, the reason that we're measuring the diameter of the trees, much like the circumference, is a good indicator of health. The thicker a tree is, the larger its diameter, the more nutrients it has to grow. And the same thing goes with these Brown Creek orchard trees. Now, as you can see here, we have two pretty polar graphs. Um, on the left, the null orchard average fruit yield. As you can see, it's very, it's, well, it was producing a lot of fruit, especially GR13A and GR13B, producing over 100 on average. However, we see here on the Browns Creek Orchard that it's producing barely above zero. And I'll explain why in just in the next slide. So. There has to be a reason why they're, one's producing more fruit and one's producing barely any. And to do that, we'll have to compare the null orchard versus the brown orchard. So the null orchard, it's higher up. Has a, it's on an elevated position, higher altitude. 
it has more fruit growth as we showed before and however it has more visible bacterial growth so we would expect it to actually have less fruit because of that and Browns Creek Orchard is further down the hill it's in an easily flooded area a floodplain in fact and it has very little fruit growth as we showed before and it has only moderate bacterial growth so really from these circumstances we would believe that Browns Creek Orchard would be producing much more fruit than Knoll Orchard. So why is it here that the graph depicts the contrary? The reason is before Browns Creek Orchard was actually planted it was used as a hay field and this farming had actually leached the nutrients out of the soil causing the uh, soil to be less nutrient dense and less healthy for any plant any subsequent planting that would happen there. So in conclusion, the Browns Creek Orchard is not as healthy as the Knoll Orchard. This is evident due to the lack of fruit that was produced in the Browns Creek Orchard. And one way we can help the Browns Creek Orchard is probably introduce a new fertilizer to help the plants grow. These are our sources. And, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Well, up next is Ari and Hay. With the Shell Electric Race. My name is Haley Cart, and this is my partner Ari Brown. And today we'll be presenting on the evaluation of heparin binding using electrophoretic mobility shift assay, abbreviated EM assay. Um, some things about me are I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. I plan on majoring in biochemistry, and I enjoy playing soccer, watching sports, hiking, and spending time outdoors. My name is Ari Brown. I'm from Maryville, Tennessee. My major is biochemistry. Um, I run cross country here at the college, and some of my favorite things are going to the mountains. Um, and two of my pictures you can see, the one on the far left was taken in the Smokies, and the one on the far right was in Cloudland Canyon in Georgia. I also love to listen to music whenever I have free time. I like, cook, I like to cook, and I love to run. Um, we would like to give a big thank you to our lab leaders, Julia Warwick and Jordan Dock for allowing us to model this experiment after one of their own that they are actually doing um, a bigger research presentation on. And we would just like to thank them for standing next to us and helping us understand every single part of this experiment so that we could better present it and just have the experience. It was amazing, so thank you. The purpose of this lab was partly, like I said, to be more comfortable and familiarize ourselves with certain lab techniques and how to use equipment um, because that is something that takes a lot of time and practice and you wouldn't really think it does, but it, it actually does. So it's also to see what protein binding looks like on gel and see how heparin combines with proteins that are naturally found in the human body and then also to evaluate if heparin binds with TLT1. So some background information before we get started into the lab is that heparin is an anticoagulant medication used after surgery to prevent dangerous blood clots from occurring. Um, it does have some pretty harmful side effects. And then TLT1 is a platelet protein that aids in blood clot formation. And fibrinogen is a plasma protein that helps form blood clots. So as you can see in the diagram on the right, these are some things we know coming into the experiment. So we know that heparin and fibrinogen bind together. We also know that fibrinogen and TLT1 bind together. What we're trying to find out in this experiment is if heparin and TLT1 bind together. This research could help um, other researchers create a better anticoagulant medication than heparin that has less dangerous side effects. So a technique that we used in this lab was gel electrophoresis. And it is a process in which an electric field is used to separate DNA, GAG, which is heparin, protein, or protein based on size. So as you can see in this diagram, this is called a gel braid. The blue rectangle is, called, is our agarose gel. The little rectangles inside of the gel are our wells, and that's where we load our protein using a pipette. Then we have on the left our negatively charged cathode side, 
On the right, we have our positively charged anode side. So as you can see on the top, that is heparin. It has negatively charged sulfate groups, which makes it negatively charged overall. So that is why heparin will move from the negative to the positive end. Okay, here is our DNA ladder, which we filled, um, which we loaded into wells one and five. It kind of acts as a ruler so that you can measure each of your proteins. Um, it's measured in base pairs, which is labeled BP up there. It's just so that we have a standard so that we can um, see the actual size of every single protein and sample that we use. So getting into the lab, the equipment materials that we used were our agarose gel, our P10 and P20 pipettes with tips to create our sample solutions, our gel loading tips to load our, gel, our protein into the gel, our 0.5 milliliter clear microfuge tubes to hold our sample solutions, our aluminum foil to cover the gel when we weren't using it because it is light sensitive, our gel rig with lid to allow electric current to flow through the gel, and our UV trans illuminator to see our results. So for part one, we created our sample solutions. So for samples one, two, and three, we use Fitzy heparin, which is, a, is heparin with a fluorescent pro probe attached to it so that we can see it in the gel. And then we use fibrinogen and TLT1. For samples four, five, and six, we use those same solutions along with regular heparin to compare. So as you can see in our table, um, samples one through six all have the Fitzy heparin. And then we added differing amounts of TLT1, fibrinogen, and regular heparin to compare in the gel. So um, after we created our sample solutions, we allowed them to incubate at room temperature for 30 minutes under aluminum foil. Part two was loading the gel. So in order to see all of our protein samples, we had to stain them, and we also had to stain our DNA ladder. So first we stained our DNA ladder, and then we put seven microliters of that into well one. For our samples, we created um, two microliter dots of gel, and we mixed that with some of, a little bit of each of one of our samples, and then we loaded that into the wells also. Um, after everything was loaded into the wells, we put the lid on the gel rig, covered it with aluminum foil to keep the light from messing up the experiment, and then we ran it at one hour at 60 volts. And then after that, we took our gel out and we ran it through the UV trains illuminator so that we can see our results, which will be on the next slide. Okay, so these are our results. At the top, you see lots of plus and minus signs. Each column is relating to each well. Um, the plus signs indicate that the sample had that protein or heparin, and then a minus sign indicates that it did not. So in well one, over on the far, okay, over on this side, we don't really see our ladder. I don't know why that is, but because of that, our results were inconclusive, just because we weren't, we couldn't really see the size of the protein. Um, well two, or, yeah, well three has heparin and TLT combined, and you can sort of see that one right here. Next to that, you see um, heparin and fibrinogen combined, and this is actually a pretty good one because you can see the whole protein, and you can see how heparin and fibrinogen combined make a much larger protein than it was on its own. On this side, we're supposed to have um, some more, but they didn't really show up, even though they did have Fitzy heparin, which has a fluorescent probe attached so that you can see. For some reason, those didn't show up. Um, but on the next slide, we have some more conclusive results that Jordan Dock, one of our lab leaders, actually did on her own. And these are much easier to see. It has the same thing with the plus and minus signs at the top, but here you can actually see that the protein is a lot bigger than it looks like in ours. Um, and also you can see how heparin and fibrinogen combined is a larger molecule on this side, but it's also one on this side that has just normal heparin as well. Um, so gel electrophoresis can be applied in many ways in the STEM field. One of those ways is DNA fingerprinting, which is seen on the picture on the right. And that can be used for a crime scene investigation as well as paternity testing. Some other applications for gel electrophoresis are gene association with illnesses, antibiotic resistance, and species distinction and genetic similarity among species. 
structure and function of proteins is what we did um, in our own experiment, and that's what we presented on to you today. And these are our sources. Does anyone have any questions? Next up is Bryce and McKenzie, and they're presenting on birds of prey. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Nicholas, and this is Bryce, and we are um, presenting on the population models involved with red-tailed hawks. My current major is biology on the pre-med track with a minor in philosophy. My, I was originally born in Seattle, Washington, but I've lived in Kingsport, Tennessee for the past 10 years. My hobbies include sewing and music, playing trumpet for Maryville College. And I'm Bryce Bales. My intended major is environmental studies. Um, I was born in Dixon, Tennessee, but I grew up in Mount Juliet, and my hobbies include reading and hiking. Before we begin, we'd like to thank Dr. Lincoln and the Red Tail Hawk Jesse for introducing us to Birds of Prey. We'd like to thank Dr. Siopsis for introducing us to Leslie Models, and we'd like to thank Dr. Unger for providing us with the data for our very first Leslie model we created. A quick summary before we begin. We're going to start off with introducing the different categories of birds of prey, and we're going to introduce Jesse, which and what makes them unique. Then we're going to explain to you what a population model is and how we applied that to our project and the implications of that model. All right. So first, we start out with red-tailed hawks. This is Dr. Lincoln and her red-tailed hawk, Jesse. Jesse was originally injured when they fell out of a tree and injured their wing. It was broken at where the wrist would be. Um, they, uh, we use they them pronouns for Jesse because we don't know what the sex of Jesse is. She, uh, they are in the middle of the size range, which is usually determined, which is usually determines the sex. But since they are in the middle, we use they them pronouns. In order to possess a bird of prey, you have to have a permit because it is illegal to kill, capture, or possess any native birds in Tennessee. These permits include education, falconry, and rehabilitation. In education, you must uh, be able to possess the bird for educational reasons only and teach other people. That is what Jesse 
is used for. And then in falconry, you capture the bird, keep it for a couple of years, and then release it. And in rehabilitation, you may keep the bird for 180 days to help it, and then release it once again. This is where we're going to introduce the categories. So first, we have BDOs, which is what Jesse happens to be. Um, so BDOs are soaring birds, meaning that they don't have to use their wings as much to stay in flight. They can just kind of glide. They have large talons and hunt larger rodents. They also eat their prey alive. The bottom left picture is a picture of a buzzard, which is a type of BDO. Um, eagles are the next. They are very similar to BDOs. The main difference is they're just physically larger. So we've included it on the same slide. The picture in the middle and the picture on the right are both examples of eagles. This is a um, size comparison between BDOs and eagles. As you can see, uh, the silhouettes, they're very, very similar in all aspects except for size. And these are the talons and the beak of a buzzard. Those would be very similar compared to on an eagle. Occipiters are smaller and swifter than the other birds of prey. They have smaller talons and they typically prey on other birds instead of rodents. Falcons have long toes and short talons and instead of grabbing and piercing at their prey, they ram them at high speeds to stun or kill them. Owls, or strigoforms as they're also known, have short toes and long talons. They have two in the front and two in the back. They have a very strong grip, so one of the stronger grips of all the birds of prey. They hunt smaller rodents, and their round face helps them to pinpoint where sound is coming from, as well as their uneven ears. All right, so the diet of a bird of prey is typically dependent on the type of beak and talon. For example, if a beak is very long, sharp, and pointy, it's used to rip the flesh from their prey. Whereas if the beak is very short, dull, but strong, it is used to crush the prey. The smaller the bird, the more that they eat relative to their body weight. And finally, birds of prey are opportunists, meaning that they will eat any type of prey available to them. So this is the red-tailed hawk. I'm going to go through the anatomy of it. First, we can see their skull. I'll go through the um, bone structure in a minute. But next, here's the beak of a red-tailed hawk. We can see that it is very sharp and pointy. So they use their beaks to tear at the prey. Next is the eye socket. It is very large, showing that they have very large eyes, which helps them to pinpoint prey from a very far distance way, meaning they have very good eyesight. Next is their wings. You can see um, red-tailed hawks have the typical BDO wing shape. They flap their wings in a figure eight to reduce drag. And also their feathers are very interwoven so that they are able to soar without flapping their wings as much. The anatomy of a feather, in this very middle, you have the vein, and then branching out from the vein, you have the barbs, and branching out from those barbs are the barbules. All those different parts interlock to, pro to form a very dense and strong feather. And finally, we have the digestive system, which consists of two chambered stomach, and when they cast up pellets of different parts of the prey that they can't digest, such as fur or bones. Here is the typical bird of prey bone structure. As you can see on the right picture, it is hollow on the inside with a latticework structure. This latticework structure allows the bone to be very light, but still extremely strong. And as you can see on the left, the latticework is denser on the outsides than it is on the insides. Because of the hollow structure, when these, bird, when these bones break, they can dry out, leading to problems later down the road and a longer healing time. So now we're going to get into what a stage-based population model is and how we learned that. So first we were taught how to use Excel by Dr. Siopsis. We were taught how to code Excel and how to put equations in multiple spaces so that we didn't have to do it individually. You can see here's an example of an equation we used where we just dragged it down and did an equation for multiple different values in one step. Leslie population models are also known as stage-based models. They show how an organism develops in their population and how that looks over time. Typically, only the females accounted for due to reproductive reasons, and they were originally created by Patrick H. Leslie. So here is our first example of a Leslie model. We originally did it with box turtles with Dr. Unger. Um, we did the population of box turtles in the Maryville College Woods. As you can see, we messed around with the values to see if we can make the population stabilize. There's our Excel file and our graph. So then we took what we learned with Dr. Unger and decided to go a step further and apply to red-tailed hawks. We decided to make our very own equations and apply that to our independent, independent research on red-tailed hawks and create our very own population models. 
So in our research, we found that red-tailed hawks typically lay one to five eggs with a nesting success rate of 58 to 93 percent, meaning that that percentage of eggs will survive into their juvenile stage, which lasts up to one and a half years to three years. And that has a 54% survival rate. So 54% of those juveniles will survive to adulthood. And then the adult persistence is 80%, meaning that 80% of those adults survive per year. And the typical red-tailed hawk lifespan is 10 to 15 years. So since a Leslie model is a stage-based model, we had to find out the stages of life for a red-tailed hawk. First, they start out as an egg. From there, those red-tailed hawks can either die or they can hatch and become juveniles, which is where we got the hatch rate times the eggs to equal the amount of juveniles. Those juveniles can either die or turn into adults, which is where we got the survival rate times the amount of juveniles. Those adults can either die, stay adults, or reproduce, which is where we got the persistence rate times the amount of adults, or the fertility rate times the amount of adults, and then the cycle keeps going around. Here are our original values, values in Excel. As you can see, we had a range of values, such as one to five eggs. You can't put a range in into our equation, so we decided to take the median as a form to discount any possible outliers. So once we use those equations you saw in our stage-based model, we were able to create a general model of a reptile hawk population using the median values. And this is an example of what the graph looks like. The uh, green line represents the total number, and starting from the bottom, you have adults, juveniles and eggs. So after we had this, we wanted to see which factors had the greatest impact on the population. So first, we took the median value of eggs laid and dropped it to one. And you can see just how different those numbers are. And as well as the graph, it becomes a lot more stabilized. So you can see that the number of eggs will, like, if the egg number dropped, the population would drop as well by a significant amount. We dropped our hatch rate from the median value to the lowest value, which while the impact wasn't as great as the eggs laid, it was still a significantly lower number for each population. And here's our graph as well. It's interesting to see that the juveniles and adults are nearly the same on this. Uh, it's almost hidden by that adult line. And finally, we dropped our juvenile time from three to one and a half. Uh, the difference wasn't as great as the other few. It's almost unnoticeable especially when you would consider the graph, it looks nearly identical. So here's a comparison of the three different changes that we made. As you can see, the amount of eggs laid and hatch rate are significantly more different than the juvenile period. So the implications of population models. They can be created for any species. They're not just limited to turtles or hawks. They can be used to preserve endangered species. So you can see, are they thriving in the wild? Are their numbers like lessening? And you can also track a particular ecosystem's health if the population is stable. That's how you know the ecosystem is staying healthy and thriving, where if they start to drop, you know something is invading or polluting the ecosystem. Here are our, our references. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, we would like to introduce Justice and Matthew for their 3D printing presentation. So my partner and I, Matthew, learned how to use Fusion 360 to create a Lego design. Uh, my name is Matthew Clark. Um, I'm majoring in biology, particularly on the pre-vet path. Uh, I'm from Greenbrier, Tennessee, here in Asheville. And um, I'm playing in the band for Maryville College, and I'm hoping to become a vet tech once I graduate from my name is Justice Williams. I'm interested in the same thing and studying pre-vet studies. I enjoy the outdoors, studying with my dog, and running cross country and rugby as well. We would like to thank our lab leaders, Megan Pogue and Hannah Simmons, who led the uh, 3D Design Lab. Megan Pogue is the secretary and treasurer of MC3D, which is the 3D Printing Club, and Hannah Simmons is the vice president. 
both are seniors and both are also part of SQ, similar to us. Um, their help in this lab was, was very important to us. So an introduction to 3D printing, it's also known as additive manufacturing, and that just means that material is layered by layer. This can be material such as wood, metal, or plastic to create a 3D design. And so some limitations of traditional manufacturing can be human labor and production costs, and 3D printing really minimizes this cost. So to start, we would like to go over some uh, terminology. So there's the shell command, which allows us to hollow out 3D objects. Planar face is a surface on which we can draw or place 2D or 3D objects. There's the create sketch option, which allows us to draw and create uh, 2D shapes. There's the extrude option, which allows us to take those 2D shapes and make them 3D. The rectangular pattern feature allows us to take uh, certain features and shapes and duplicate them on columns and rows by whatever number and distance we would wish. Uh, the fillet option allows us to take sharp edges and uh, shapes and round them out to our desired amount. The offset feature allows us to take a circle and duplicate it on the same center point with a different diameter. The dimension option allows us to take certain shapes and reposition them in, uh, position in accordance with another point. And the center diameter control allows us to place a circle on a point, which will be the center point of that circle. And so we use the orientation box to view our 3D design. And so by clicking and dragging anywhere on that six-sided die, we can view our creation. And so before we begin actually building the Lego in our project, we have to create a new project and create a new component just for organization purposes. We also determine the units. So in our case, we use millimeters to replicate the actual design of a Lego because it's really small. But if you're working with larger scale objects, you could use feet or meters. So to start with creating our Lego, we first need to lay the profile of the Lego brick from above. So to do that, we use the Create Sketch tool in order to choose a plane and then the 2D point rectangle tool to draw the profile of the Lego to the specific requirements down to the millimeter. And so using that blueprint that Matthew just described, we can actually use the extrusion tool to add depth to create the Lego body. And then we also save our project so that we don't lose our beloved Lego file. Then we can look at the top of that Lego brick that we had created placing a circle in one of the corners and choosing the diameter to be appropriate for the knobs at the top of Legos. We can then use the dimension tool in order to change where that circle is placed in relation to the size of the rectangle and extrude it upwards to create the 3D effect of the Lego knob, which will help us click them into the bottom of the Legos. And so in order to duplicate that first knob, we use the rectangular pattern tool to duplicate it across rows and columns um, for a set quantity and dimension. And then once we're finished with creating the knobs on top, we can turn the Lego over and use the, utilize the shell command in order to hollow out the bottom inside of the Lego brick, which will allow us to later add other parts and then be able to place them onto the top of the Lego blocks. And so from there, we use a construction line tool just as a reference point to where the fitting panel would be on the back side of the Lego that allows it to connect. And so we use the offset feature to create a circle within a circle almost to create that fitting panel. And once we have that offset circle created, we can use the extrude tool to take the ring that that has created, extrude it upwards, and create the fitting panel that we would like to have then duplicate it with the same rectangular feature option in order to have uh, two more placed along in the same row. This will allow us to be able to connect our Lego on top of others and have them interlock. And so finally use the fillet tool to kind of smooth out the corners of the circle. Um, so I guess it's a little easier if you step on it. Which. Then the application. So. 
It can be used for hobbies. A lot of people use this website called Thinkiverse, and so it's a platform that allows people to share designs. Um, so in this case, the user designed a polar bear trying to reach up to grab a fish, which is actually caught by a seal instead. And similarly, um, designers of all sorts of things, such as rings, other jewelry, uh, anything that is expensive, can be used to 3D print the design using a plastic resin or other materials before using the more expensive materials and more expensive uh, means so that they can see if their design is appropriate for what they're intending. Also, there's been some experimentation of 3D printing housing using large 3D printing rigs that use mortar or concrete in order to create houses. For example, this one in Dallas, Texas, which was an experiment only took 24 hours and only cost $4,000 to create, and it is about 620 square feet. And then finally, there's plenty of healthcare applications that 3D printing can be applied to. Here I have a dental application. So someone could create a plastic molding of their teeth using 3D printing. Again, we would like to thank Megan Pogue and Hannah Simmons for teaching us how to use Fusion 360. We also wanted to show off this final rendering of the Lego brick in Fusion 360 as well, where we were able to put a glossy red finish and choose the lighting that we felt was appropriate. We were then able to print our Legos out, and as you can see... This here is the 3D printed Lego, and this here is the factory made Lego. And as you can see, they connect right together. Smith. I'm from Oliver Springs, Tennessee. I graduated from Cofield High School. I plan on majoring in biology. I also plan on playing softball here at Maribel College. My name is Kayla Love. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. I intend to major in computer science. I enjoy skateboarding and I plan on be riding a trailer. We'd like to say a special thank you to Dr. Bajorno for leading this lab and being here to answer all our questions we've had throughout the making of this presentation. The background um, for this lab and the purpose was to run PCR and find different microbial DNA, specifically looking for the NAR gene, which is responsible for nitrate reduction. We used gel electrophoresis and the DNA easy kit. And before we get into it, we'd like to explain some terminology. Copy tubes are plastic tubes with a Experiments and laboratories. A centrifuge is an instrument used to separate things by spinning. A vortex is an instrument that mixes solids and liquids together. To incubate means to keep variables at a suitable temperature. Electrophoresis is a process used to separate molecules based on their size. And PCR or polymerase chain reaction is a method widely used. On the first day in the lab, we retrieved two different samples of mud and placed them into two different tubes, and then we took a smaller sample out of one of the tubes and centrifuged it to separate the water from the mud. Next, we extracted pore water from the mud with a syringe and tilted it into a separate tube. We repeated this process until the liquid was gone, and then we stored our samples at 4 degrees Celsius or 39.2 degrees Next, we put soil into a power bead tube and then we vortexed it. And then we added solution C1 and vortexed again and then centrifuged to separate the mud from the water. And then we added solution C2 and repeated that process. Next, we transferred the liquid to another collection tube. We added C3, we vortexed it to mix, incubated it, and we centrifuged it to separate the solids from the liquids. We transferred the solution C4, added it to the liquid, and we vortexed the liquid. 
Then we transferred the liquid to a spin column. We centrifuged and then discarded the flow through and we repeated this process until the liquid was gone. Next, we added solution C5 and then centrifuge, discarded, and centrifuged again. We placed the empty spin column into a collection tube in order to separate DNA beads and allow any impurities to pass through. We added the C6 into the center, we centrifuged, we discarded it, and soon the DNA was ready for downstream application. And then we added one microliter to the PCR master mixes. On the last day, on a piece of parafilm, we transferred the ladder, the sample, and our negative control, which is nucleus-free water. Then we mixed each dot with dye, and then we loaded each dot into its own well. And lastly, we conducted gel electrophoresis for an hour at 100 volts. And lastly, we checked our results using a UV transit locator. We expected to see uh, the presence of the NARG gene after PCR amplifications. But as you can see here, this is our results. And we didn't detect any bands of the NARG. Um, this is what it should have looked like. And this is how the ladder should have played out, but it didn't. We think that this happened because of a contamination error. In regards to our own lab results, we hypothesized that the oxygen level in the soil and from the rain could have been responsible for demolishing the NARG gene. Um, in order to optimize results, if we were to conduct this experiment again, we follow correct protocol and procedures, uh, especially considering that DNA is easily contaminated. We repeat this using wetter mud samples in order to improve the yield of poor water, and we would also investigate the freezer temperature in sudden to 11, considering that the ladder was the Um, and also future work could be, or this lab could be used in the future in order to assess uh, growth rate and health in the soil of the MC Wood and both of the orchards, considering we could look for uh, the NARG gene and see if it's present in any of the soil and compare the rates of growth in the fruit in the orchard. These are our sources. Are there any questions? Again, we would like to say thank you to Dr. Pajorno, Assistant Professor of Environmental Biology. And as a whole, our whole group would like to say thank you to the National Science Foundation for funding and grants, Dr. Gibson and Dr. Seopsis for developing this program, all the professors who have helped throughout these couple of weeks, our peer mentors, and Lindsay Walton who manages the SQ program. Thank you. I'd just like to say a couple of things, mostly to our newly minted Scott Science Scholars, who we are so proud of for such obvious reasons after we've seen these great presentations. This is the end of your summer experience, but it's really just the beginning for you here at Maryville College and beyond. In the last 10 days, you've worked super hard. You have shown us curiosity. You have shown us resilience. You've shown us good attitudes and smiles, even under the masks, we can tell. Um, you've exhibited resilience. You've climbed a tower. You were outside in the heat looking for turtles with your faces covered. You've done all kinds of things, and you've dealt with changes and challenges every single day. And we've changed the expectations on you multiple times, too. So there was that added layer of it. So all through that time, you've been supporting each other. You've become friends. You've probably shared some frustrations, and you've probably shared some victories. This is what we're trying to build for you. We're trying to make sure that you have a group of folks that you're going to walk through this Maryville College experience with in STEM. I want you to think about all those things I've just said that you've done. You've been resilient, you've met challenges, you've built skill. 
And think about those seniors who showed you how to do labs, who showed you 3D printing. Those seniors, just four years ago, were right here where you are. So in four years, I'm going to expect to see some of you on the slides being thanked for leading great activities with our new freshmen coming in. So keep doing all these great things that you've been doing. If you can, these are the markers of successful college students that you are going to be, and you're going to be the ones who show other college students how to do that. So again, thank you for all your hard work, your good attitude, your smiles, and we're going to see you tomorrow in class. So thanks a lot. We are the sum total of our educations, of the experiences we have, and the lessons we learn. At Merrillville College, you study everything, so you'll be prepared for anything, because life is filled with the unexpected. Wherever your path takes you, we'll make sure you're ready to lead.